Thank you. One of the benefits that I have of traveling a lot is that it reminds me that the church is not a location, it's not a building, it's the people of God. And everywhere I go, I am reminded that it does not matter where I come from or where you come from, we are together. We are one in Christ, regardless of our background, regardless of our country. We worship together, we learn together, we grow together, and it's, it's a tremendous honor for me to be able to travel and remember that almost every day. It's also an honor for me to be here. Uh, I visited this church several years ago with uh, uh, Dr. Philip and now have the opportunity to be back. So this morning we're going to be looking at a passage from Genesis chapter 16. Now all of us, no matter our nationality, no matter our position in life, all of us want to be seen. We want to be known. We want people to recognize that we are here and that we, value, that we are valued. In the Old Testament, very frequently, people would give God a name that would remind them of some characteristic of God. It would, it would not capture all of who God is, but it would focus on one characteristic that this person had seen in God and it would give for them a special meaning. In Genesis chapter 16, we read about a slave girl by the name of Hagar. And Hagar came face to face with God. God saw her in her distress. God saw her with all of the potential that she still had. And so she called God the Hebrew name El Rai, which is, a, which is the Hebrew for the God who sees me. So take your Bibles, if you would. Turn to Genesis chapter 16. In Genesis chapter 16, beginning in, the, at the, in verse 1, it says, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian maidservant named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my maidservant. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan for 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian maidservant Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my servant in your arms, and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your servant is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think is best. Then Sarai mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will so increase your descendants that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, You are now with child, and you will have a son. You shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man, and his hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. In verse 13, it says, She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her, you are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. So let me pray for us quickly, and then we'll look more closely at this amazing encounter that Hagar has with God. Father, we acknowledge, as we have already sung, that you are Jehovah. You are our mighty God. We ask now that you would give us wisdom, uh, give us discernment, help us 
not just to learn some new things in our heads, help us to move this to our hearts, help our lives to be changed, help us to understand you a little more deeply so that we are better prepared to serve you as you call us to do that. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Now, at that time in the Middle East, a wife was expected to provide children. And if she was not able to have children, it was a great shame for her. It was so important in that culture that if the couple did not have children within 10 years, the husband was permitted to divorce his wife so that he could marry another woman and try to have children with her. That was considered completely acceptable and it was perfectly legal. If your wife did not give you children, you could remove her and find another wife. Now there was another option that was also accepted in that culture. If for some reason you did not want to divorce your wife, you could take one of your slaves and have children with her. If that was the case, if that happened, then legally the child that the husband had with the slave would become legally the child of the wife not the slave. That way, the wife would remove her shame by having a child from another woman. The child would become the heir, would be a full child, and the family would be able to continue. So at the time this, this story begins in Genesis chapter 16, Abram and Sarai had been living in the, in the area of Canaan, it says, for 10 years and no children. So at this point, Abram is legally allowed to divorce Sarai and take another wife. That did not sound like a good plan to either of them, apparently. So Sarai said, we have a better way to fix this problem. Here is my servant, my slave, Hagar. Abram, you go sleep with her, then we will have a child that will be our legal child, and she's probably thinking at that point, this will remove her shame, they will have a family, and Abram will have the heir. In this whole story, each one of the people involved made some major mistakes. It begins right up at the beginning when Sarai blames God for her lack of children. At this point, God had already promised Abram and Sarai that they would have a child. And in her, it's understandable, it's been 10 years, but it's a lack of faith. She says, God has prevented me from having children. So right at the beginning, she starts making mistakes. She blames God for the problems in her life. And then she told Abram to sleep with her slave. Abram made the equally bad decision to agree with her. So he slept with Hagar. And then once she was pregnant, Hagar made the bad decision to disrespect her master, Sarai. And then Sarai blamed Abram for that problem too. She then began to mistreat Hagar. Now, the passage does not tell us exactly how she mistreated Hagar, but she made life so miserable for this, this woman that Hagar ran away. Hagar, we're told, was Egyptian, so she was running to try and get home. This is a very long distance through some, some huge desert areas, and she's traveling alone. In that day, a woman's very survival was dependent on her family, her tribe, her clan. So this is a desperate act from Hagar. She's pregnant, she's alone, she has no support, she's left everything behind, and she's trying to get through the desert. Her chances of survival were very small. She was almost surely going to die alone as she tried to get back to Egypt. Hagar made it as far as a spring of water. It was at that time that God appeared. Now the text says the angel of the Lord. Scholars have studied this and 
they're in general agreement that it was, this was not just an angel. Based on the interaction, based on the scholars' uh, best thinking, this is actually God. In verse 8, it says, and he said, this would be God, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. God asked questions designed to help Hagar think about what she was doing. As the slave of Sarai, she was running from the place she was supposed to be, and she was running to a likely death in the desert. It's time for her to stop and think about what she's doing. God already knew where she had come from. God already knew where she was trying to go. The questions were designed to get Hagar to think about what was happening. And he then proceeds to tell her she needs to go back to Sarai, the one who had mistreated her. The news was not all bad, however. God said if she did go back to the place she was supposed to be, despite whatever those consequences would be, her son would become the first in a long line. Her family would be so large that it would not be able to be counted. In other words, if she went back to where she was supposed to be, she would be the mother of a huge family. Descendants so numerous she couldn't count, Hagar would now be respected. And she would be respected as the mother of a large family, and this large family would be able to provide for her. Hagar, of course, all by herself in the middle of the desert, away from any family, friends, clan, any support, was amazed at this promise. So as she realized that she had just encountered God in person, she called him El Rai. It's the name the Bible tells us that means the God who sees. Hagar obeyed God. She went back. The passage does not really tell us anything about Sarai's reception. We don't know if Sarai continued to mistreat her afterwards or if Sarai realized her mistake and apologized and treated her well. We're not told what Sarai did. We are told, though, that Abram went ahead and named this child Ishmael, which means Abram must have listened when Hagar returned. He obeyed God, finally. We know from the life of Abram that he kind of goes back and forth on that. In this case, he obeyed God. Ishmael got the name God intended for him. And again, in this one short story, we see Sarai, Abram, Hagar, all making major life mistakes. Sarai blames God. Then she comes up with a solution that is counter to what God had suggested. Then Abram goes along with it. When it works and they have a child, Hagar blames, or Sarai blames Abram. Then she abuses Hagar. Then Hagar runs away. It's just one mistake after another. And then as we stop and think about how this applies to our own lives, we realize we all do that. All of us make mistakes. Sometimes they're conscious mistakes and we simply disobey God. Often we simply do the wrong thing. It's just part of who we are as humans. Sooner or later we make a bad decision. Sooner or later we blame others for our own failings. We hurt someone or perhaps we run away from our problems instead of facing them. That list of our mistakes just goes on and on and on. And then, like Hagar did, we find ourselves in one of those bad places in life, sort of our equivalent of being all by ourselves at a spring in the middle of a desert. And then we look around and wonder what's going to happen next. Now, sometimes it's all our fault. We've made a mistake, we run away, whatever the mistake may be. We find ourselves in a bad place of life and we can only attribute that to our own failure. Sometimes too though, we find ourselves in a bad place of life because of someone else's mistake. 
As people, we have to live with the consequences of sin and mistakes. We live with the consequences of our own mistakes. We also have to live with the consequences of other people's mistakes. Sooner or later, we find ourselves in one of those bad places in life. And God sees. Wherever we are in life, we discover God is El Rayi. God is the one who sees. He knows where we are, and he knows what's going on in our lives. Now, this whole thing has sort of, it's like a coin with two sides. On one side of the coin, God sees us when we wish he would not see us. Psalm 139 says this. It says, O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. Jumping down a little to verse 7, it says, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light will be night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like day, for darkness is as light to you. This is, this is the psalmist talking about the fact that no matter what he does, he cannot hide from God. If he tries to hide in the dark, he realizes that the darkness will not hide us. No matter how high he climbs or how low he goes, God will always see. Now, we realize that when we sin, almost always our first response is to hide the sin. We don't want anyone to see what's happening. We we try to run and we hide and we hope that no one, including God, will ever find out what we have just done. That's what David's talking about here. Even if I try to hide, even if I don't want you to see what's going on in my life, you can see it. So the first side of this two-sided coin is that even if we want to hide, even if we wish God did not know what we were doing or what we had just done, God is El Rayi. God sees. Now, the other side of this coin is that God cares deeply enough about you and me that he is paying close attention to our lives. In the book of Matthew, Jesus said it like this. In verse 29, he said, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your Father. And even the very hairs of your head are numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. This is the other side of that same coin. God cares deeply about us, and he is paying attention. Right down to him knowing the number of hairs on our head. As we get ready and move into the season of Easter, that's what this is all about. God cares so deeply that he would send his son. Easter celebrates the fact that he sacrificed his son on our behalf and his son rose to pay the price. All of this is tied into the reality that God sees us. Whether we want him to or not, he is El Rayi. 4,000 years after Hagar ran away, we're still recounting the story of Hagar. Because 4,000 years later, we're still people. And we still want to be known. We want to be seen. We want to be valued. And we're reminded with this name, El Rayi, that God sees us. God values us. God cares deeply about what is happening in our lives. As, as culture continues to change, as the 21st century continues to, to seem to pick up speed and the world gets more, more and more difficult to, to seem to navigate, 
we can remember that God is El Rai. No matter how difficult the world gets around us, no matter how fast things change, God sees. God sees us when we don't want Him to. And that's where the death and resurrection of His Son come in. He cares so deeply that He wants to make things right. As with Hagar, He calls us to go back to where we should be. God will step into the ugly things of our lives and make them beautiful. As He did with Hagar. Hagar was in just about the worst place you could possibly be as a woman in that culture. Alone, in the desert, pregnant, with no hope, and very little possibility of surviving. She'd been abused, she'd been mistreated, she'd run away, and God saw. God asked her to think about where she had come from and where she was going, and then he provided her with insight. Sarah, I go back, and I will make this ugly situation in your life into something amazing. I will give you a son, and he will have children, and your family will be so large that they will not be counted. Sooner or later, we all make bad decisions. We make mistakes we sin, we abandon God's direction in favor of something that seems like a better option. And sooner or later, we find ourselves in a terrible position in life through no fault of our own. Life happens, other people make mistakes, circumstances are out of our control, and we get to one of those places that feels very much like we are alone in the desert with no hope and no future. And God sees. However far we have wandered, or however far we have been pushed by others' mistakes and sins, God knows where we are. It doesn't really matter how we got there. God still sees. God still sees us, and He is still desiring to make something beautiful out of that which is awful in our lives. I imagine Hagar would not possibly imagine, as she stumbled up to that spring in the desert, that anyone could possibly give hope. And God saw. And God came to her personally. In the Old Testament, that was completely unusual. In the New Testament, God is present with us. In the New Testament, we can have personal encounters with God simply because when our faith in, is in Him, we have the Holy Spirit in our lives. We can go directly to God. God sees. Whether we want Him to or not, He cares. So wherever you are in life today, however you got to this point, remember God is still El Rai. God still sees, God still cares, God still wants to be deeply involved in your life. And God still wants to make something beautiful out of whatever ugly situation you may be in. Let me pray for us. God, we thank you today that you are still El Rai. You are still the God who sees me. We thank you that you know us better than we know ourselves. Even before we say something, you know what we're going to say. You know how many hairs are on our heads. You care deeply, and we thank you for that. Thank you that you do not abandon us no matter how we got to where we are. But you meet us personally, and you ask, where have you come from, and where are you going? God, I pray for each of us in this room, for each of us who are watching online, that we would recognize your presence in our lives, that we would recognize that you care deeply and that you truly want to be a part of our lives. You truly want to make something beautiful out of whatever's happening in our lives. We give you praise for who you are. We give you praise for what you will do in our lives. We give you praise in the name of Jesus. 
Amen.